please put your hands together and welcome Snowy. What a great introduction. Thank you so much. Um, I, I guess my title is cultural strategist, um, which sounds sort of really quite lame, but actually is the best way I can describe what I do. Um, I originally worked in the music industry and, uh, and then went on from managing um, artists and record labels to work for a youth media group who published magazines, fashion titles, music magazines. Um, they also owned an uh, online street art shop that managed Banksy and Jamie Hewlett. Um, and a youth photo archive and I worked with them in the very early days to help this is probably about I don't know at least 10 years ago now which is making me really feel my age to help them start to work with brands to understand how to help brands connect with young people through culture and content um, and by virtue of that technology obviously nowadays the majority of young people and the majority of people connect with culture through technology um, and some of the really amazing things that we've seen in um, the Future Laboratories presentation, I'm going to kind of dwell on slightly um, and kind of follow on from and look at how those things actually relate to young, the younger generation, um, looking at their attitudes to technology and how they engage. Um, so the first thing I thought I'd start with was a quote from Douglas Adams, um, the brilliant author of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, and his quote says, I've come up with a set of rules that describe our reactions to technologies. Anything that is in the world when you're born is normal and ordinary, and it's just a natural part of the way the world works. Anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new and exciting and revolutionary, and you can probably get a career in it. Big one. Anything invented after you're 35 is totally against the natural order of things. It's terrifying and scary, and we don't want to know anything about it. Thank you very much. Um, and I absolutely love this quote because I think it really sums up probably what a lot of us feel. Firstly, what a lot of the generation who are out there solving those briefs now feel about point two. And actually what a lot of us probably feel about point three. So I don't want to know. I'm going to bury my head in the sand. I'm going to be record industry exec and I'm never going to have a future. Um, and actually what I want to talk about today very quickly because I've only got 20 minutes and someone's going to maybe have to wave at me when I've got to keep my time. Thanks, Belinda. Um, is, uh, is actually that um, because of the, what technology has given us and because of the opportunities it's created and because it has opened the whole world up for people, nowadays um, the younger generation aren't actually as scary as we'd like to think, despite that video that Mark just showed us about them all racing off on getaway mopeds. Um, they're actually a generation of, of doers and makers and they're an incredibly positive generation because they have the world at their fingertips through technology. And actually what I want to talk about today are a series of themes that can help us understand how to work with them to our own benefits. You know, how can we work with young people um, and harness all of that knowledge that they have about the world and get them to work with us, humans and technology working together for better results. So um, I think the first thing to mention is that this, for this generation, we talk about online behaviour and behaviour in relation to technology. That, it doesn't work like that for them. It's just behaviour. It's just, they, don't dis, they don't distinguish between when they're online and then when they're watching TV and then when they're pl out playing tennis in the park. Everything, physical, digital, technology, online, offline, it's just all one thing for them. It's all just behaviour. And I think that's the first thing that we want to kind of touch on today. And there's seven themes that I'm going to go through. First is mobile, second is makers, the third is entrepreneurs, the fourth is advice seekers, nostalgics, flashers, don't get excited, and um, endorsers. Um, and so I'm going to whiz through each of these. I've got a couple of videos, um, but it's uh, fairly, uh, fairly visual. So uh, let's uh, get cracking. So the first is mobile. Um, I thought this, the story that you told Martin was really interesting about the intern. Because we had um, a couple of interns in one of the agencies I work with, and they were a creative team, and they came in. And the problem that they were there to solve was about um, was, was a mobile problem. And we sat there, and these two guys said, well, did you know, apparently in the olden days, when you arranged to meet someone, you, you had to actually stick to the meeting because you weren't able to, you couldn't call them once you'd left the house. I was like, that's not the olden days. That's my teenage years. That's what happened. You called someone at their house. You arranged to meet them. And then once you went and left the building and left the house, you couldn't change the meeting. And that now, the idea of that is just so scary now. Imagine not being able to say, I'm 20 minutes late. I'm stuck on the tube. It's just such a different world. And for young people, mobile is everything. Um, and 
one of the things I think is really important about mobile is that it is viewed as a thing we optimise for. And to go back to some of the things that you were talking about, optimization is not the answer, prioritization is the answer. 79%, I believe, of people who view content nowadays will view it on mobile, or possibly even more. You know, it is all mobile. Um, what's interesting about Google Glass is that for the younger generation, Google Glass is just, it's, it's a state of mind. It's how they're already thinking about the world. So for us, it's like Minority Report, and it's, you know, it's this incredible new technology that is actually really quite weird and wonderful, and can you actually believe that we're in an age where you can have this eyewear and you can ask it to record a video? Actually, all it is is an extension of the body and the mind of the way young people already think about the world. It's just facilitating what's already natural to them, and that's what's kind of exciting about it. They live in a very immersive world. They live in a world where everything can be functionalised, so everything can be captured or shared or recorded or tweeted or, you know, whatever. Everything is, and technology is just a natural extension. Um, and because of this, because they're multitasking, because they tend to have about seven or eight windows of activity open at any one time, and they're talking to a friend on the phone, and they're, you know, doing something on their mobile, they're watching something, they're listening to something, they're just immersed in stuff that's going on around them all the time. And so, actually, the type of um, behaviour that they will engage with is, is these kind of endless content browsing apps. So things like Tumblr and Twitter are actually much more the natural home of the younger generation than something like Facebook. Um, this is a, a new uh, shopping app or a social kind of clothes sharing app which allows you to uh, recommend clothes, favourite clothes and, just, and then share them. But the interesting thing about it is it's got a Tumblr style interface and a Pinterest style interface where you're just constantly scrolling. You know, people don't want to just jump onto one place and view, ex explore that place and then jump out and go somewhere else. They're just, it's this rolling kind of behaviour. Um, which is why, although Facebook is absolutely um, a, a, you know, a huge wealth of information and a huge opportunity for retailers and for clients, 40% um, of, of young people, young being sort of in this case 18 to 29 year olds, expect to spend less time on it this year. In fact, in this survey, which was done by the Pew Research Centre last year, I believe, only 1% of people of this age group said they'd spend more time on Facebook. It's really interesting. So I guess the summary on that is, um, rather than think about, which we've all been taught to do, which I've particularly been taught to do in my background as a strategist and a planner, is create the holy grail of the brand, create the ivory tower of the brand, don't deviate from the brand, here's the brand guidelines, here's the brand values, build a website that is the online expression of the brand. Actually, really, what is the smarter way to think if you want to connect with people of the future and not just engage the people that in 20 years are going to be 10 feet under, um, think about less about the brand and how it's applied in a, sort of in, a, in a shrine online, but think about your product and about the multi-dimensional ways that your product can behave and how you can be in lots of different places and do lots of different things with your product. So think maybe apps over websites, multiple apps, for example. Um, the second theme is makers. This is David Karp, who I'm sure you're all familiar with because he's now an incredibly rich young man. And he's the founder of Tumblr. Um, and he is the kind of poster boy for this creator generation. And he's the poster boy for this particular theme. Um, he is really about a... Well, he is the kind of poster boy for creators who want to interpret the world in their own way. Technology allows people not only to view the world and to access the world and to be very knowledgeable about the world, but they can actually reinterpret it and play with it. And that's what's really interesting. Um, so... This is a quote uh, in a recent interview from Bloomberg. There was something I wanted. There was a tool that I wanted to use that didn't exist. And I found myself increasingly frustrated with the direction that the technology was going, which was less and less creative. It was more and more about these restrictive tools where you put your photos in this directory, you put your articles over here, and I wanted something where I could be free and where I could do anything. So this idea of moving information from one box to another, sort of not interesting anymore. They're just not really bothered. They want to interact with it. They want to reinterpret it. And they want to play with it. And they want to create with it. Um, so that really is, from a young person's perspective, that's really where the future is. This, I don't know how many people know what this little weird circuit board thing is. Have you seen this? This little beauty was invented by a couple of British uh, computer engineers. And it's called the Raspberry Pi. And it's £16. And it's basically a mini computer 
that allows kids to code. So kids can code it, they can make it do all kinds of manner of things, and it's really DIY, it's really, really lo-fi. It costs 16 quid, and it sold over a million units, and they made it. And they put it out there, and they were like, oh my god, we've made a computer, brilliant. And then suddenly they're selling a million units. It's huge. It's on the front cover of this month's Wired. And the story is really interesting if you have a look at it. Because what it actually shows is that kids want to make stuff. And because the technology that we have at the moment is so expensive, they don't feel that they can make things because they are playing on their dad's Mac or they're looking at a Bang & Olufsen Hi-Fi or they've got the, you know, mum's iPhone or smartphone or their own iPhone or smartphone. It doesn't really allow them the possibilities to, to kind of take it apart and put it back together again in an interesting way. Um, a third of 18 to 34-year-olds in the US have coded. It actually seems, is that, does that seem quite high to you? Yes. So that's quite surprising. I think it's really surprising and I think what's interesting about it is that if you look at Probably a lot of you will have seen the recent, oh, well, I think yesterday, the launch of the new Apple hardware and the, you know, the, how Apple behave is very much about this, again, an ivory tower where you can only use Apple kit and you can only use Apple products and it only works with Apple systems. Do you know what? The future is not about that. The future is open source, open access, allow people to play with your code, allow people to understand how your business and your product works and get them to do stuff with you. And actually, for a lot of young people, that Apple model and that Apple way of speaking and that rhetoric of the, you know, we are the overlords, it's actually becoming less and less relevant nowadays. This is really fun. This is called a makey makey. <laughs> um, I was going to bring one. I've got one in my locker at work, but I forgot it. I'm kind of annoyed about that. Mm. It's an invention kit that allows you to turn everyday objects into touchpads. So there's a really good video, which I won't show you, but if you go online and have a look at it, it was funded on Kickstarter, and it's one of their biggest success stories. They'd smashed their target by, like, 2,000%. And what it allows you to do is you can hook up a banana or a shoe or your cat um, to the Internet, and then you can d make stuff happen. It's really fun. It's really silly, but it's absolutely indicative of what young people are interested in doing. And it's amazing. People pick it up, and they, just, they can do stuff with it. I mean, I can't really do anything with it. I've tried, um, and I will learn, but it's so natural to those people. And that's really fun. So I think the moral of this story is think beyond social media to creative media. Um, that's not saying social media is dead, but it's what this is about is really trying to think ahead so that we don't find ourselves constantly playing catch-up. Um, the third theme is entrepreneurs. So rather than wait for the world to come to them, young people are increasingly making it happen for themselves. So technology has created huge amounts of opportunity. It's also created empowerment. And if you think about the kids who were in school, who were sort of this kind of very enlightened, very lucky generation, really, who had this sort of have it all, you know, you can be anything you want to be, and the world's a great place, and then suddenly there's a complete global collapse, economy is completely on its knees, recession, unemployment, no one can get jobs. I'm really glad the students are outside when I'm talking about this, because it's really scary. And actually, um, a lot of these kids, because of that, are actually going out and finding ways to make stuff happen for themselves, and that's really exciting. So... It's never been easier or more exciting to make your own ideas happen or to become involved in other people's. I think the success of Kickstarter is a really, really great sign of how much people want to get involved in other people's businesses and start their own thing and see if the world wants to help them. Um, it's a very can-do generation, and that's really, really exciting, and it's not scary. Um, there was a, a, a survey done by the London Business School recently, and they called it the Reflexive Generation, and they found, in, of all the kids that they surveyed... 79% uh, of young people in the UK prefer to be mobile workers rather than static workers. That's quite interesting. So that's kind of that's a really, really high number of people who say, do you know what, I'm not really interested in a desk job that's got security. I want to kind of be flexible. So it's a total shift in attitude. Um, crowdfunded projects are big news. In some cases, outperforming expectations. Uh, these two examples are ones that you can go and have a look at yourselves because I can't possibly begin to do them justice in how they work. But I think the... the, the the point I'm making is that these are examples of projects that have absolutely overcome any kind of possible, I can't do this. You know, they've smashed their targets. Pledges received, requested, 950,000. Pledges received, 8.5 million. It's really amazing. So those are two really good success stories of crowdfunding platforms. 
Um, and if we look at something that's much, maybe much more relevant to, to the kind of people that we have in the room today, something like ASOS Marketplace is a really great example of a business that are, is looking at what they can do to empower their customers. So they're saying customers are really entrepreneurial. They've got their own businesses. They're making their clothes. They want to sell them. Let's give them a platform to do it. So Marketplace allows kids and young people and people um, to set up their own shops and they can sell and trade to each other and it's really nice because it totally plays into the, you know, the thing that they're already wanting to do. So they're facilitating, they're creating opportunity. So I guess the kind of uh, take out from that is create platforms that empower young people to make things happen for themselves. How am I doing on time? All right. Oh, okay, right. Um, advice seekers. So, with an increasingly connected life, young people are now turning to technology for emotional guidance. So, when we uh, were young and we um, needed advice, we asked our parents, we asked our friends, we asked our family, we had a cup of tea, we went for a beer, so what shall I do about this? With an increasingly connected life, young people are turning to technology because that's the thing they have around them. They're turning to technology to ask for guidance on, on the problems that they have in life. Converse is a brand that's done really interesting things with this, and I'm going to play you a short video because um, it's about using function, more than just function, more than just entertainment, about it being a friend and a confidant. I'll probably play the start of this and then uh, gloss over. What's the first thing you do when you go online? You go to Google. Google is a new gateway to culture, and Google Trends shows us the zeitgeist, what people care about and when. At this very moment, a teenager is typing into this little box what they're thinking, what they're looking for, questions they're too scared to ask anybody else, about moments in culture that are happening that day, people everywhere on their computers asking a question. Any brand can buy these keywords. The more competition, the higher the price. So why are no brands buying the keywords teenagers are actually searching? This insight led us to our big idea. Be the first brand to build a campaign around low competition, low cost searches that connect us directly to our audience. So here's how it works. Unfortunately, I'm going to flick through that because you, I can send, we can send you that as a case study. It was um, done by Anomaly in New York, it's one of the agencies I work with, and it won an FE recently. And the interesting thing about that was they bought search terms that were based on emotional searches, not based on product searches. So it's not about information, it's about emotion. They bought search terms like, around prom night, how do I kiss? And then they served up bits of content that were really fun, really playful, and really low cost to fans teenagers who were searching for those things so they were there at the moment that they needed some emotional guidance with something that was fun something that was playful they did hundreds of these videos and they created a whole ecosystem around being there in a moment when kids need us um, and it's a great case study you can find it online but I'll make sure I send the link around because it's really really worth watching and the best thing was that Google then latched onto it but not for quite a while so after a while Google went hey what are you doing with that search thing we no hang on you're buying these really cheap search terms and we're all over that. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, this is about nostalgia and uh, going uh, back to the presentation that the guys um, gave earlier, you know, the technology is the future, everything's digital, everything's connected, the internet of everything, we, our fridge is going to talk to our phone and, you know, my iPad um, programs are going to make my cat hungry when I need them to be and all that sort of thing. So, Yes, everything is more technology-focused and technology-based, but actually there is a real nostalgia for real things, and there's been an amazing uh, surge recently in things like the sales of vinyl, things like handwritten letters, because naturally, by human nature, when something becomes more popular and more prevalent, we kick against it, and we want something that's an antidote to it. And so nostalgia is uh, really about the increasing value that the tangible has and how that works with technology. So more tech, more choices... It means we have a greater understanding of the world, not just the future, but also the past. So this is an example of a company who, weirdly, take MP3 files and turn them into vinyl records. It's really weird, but, and it doesn't really seem like such a long time since that this was all happening the other way around. But it's a really good example of how people hang, you know, yearn for something that's from the past. And actually, even young people who've been um, interviewed as part of this survey that JWT did with Frank Rose, who's a correspondent for Wired, um, they found that 69% of these young people had a kind of interest in things that aren't used as much as they used to be. It's really, really brilliant. But it's about how technology and how the past and the real world, world work together. These little um, canister creations are, are digitally produced, but they're produced on the back of an old film canister. And these have got, there's a huge following for this guy's work over in the States. Um, so they have this feeling of being really old despite being really new. 
So use technology to enrich the real world experience, not just not to replace it. It doesn't have to replace everything. Uh, so got two final themes. So this one is flashes. The moment is everything. Bite size, quick, disposable. When we first uh, invented, well, when we when we first had use of Facebook, um, we spent a lot of time labouring over our profiles. You know, think what oh, what wallpaper shall I have? You know, what photos really craft my status update? And let's think about the music. Actually, nowadays people aren't really that bothered about that. They don't dwell on the identity so much. But what they do want is content that they can quickly share with people in a moment to make a connection because they're constantly connecting with people, more and more people every day, all the time, and they need to make that instant more interesting. So Snapchat. I don't know if you are aware of Snapchat, but it's a, it's a basically an app that allows you to share a photo and then say how long you want that photo to be alive for. It's really incited this incredibly flirtatious online behaviour, but that's actually naturally how young people are behaving. They are flirting. They're talking to everyone and they're just giving everyone a little bit of something interesting. Um, and uh, so it's all about content sharing as many connections as frequently as possible, but give them something fun in the moment. Um, Vine is another great example of an app that's doing that. Twitter app, short form video, allows you to share and create loads and loads and loads of little videos and then connect with people. It's really lovely. So be in the moment with something that can be personalised and easily shared. Um, and I think I'm OK for time. My final one is endorsers. Um, and this is going back to the idea of free culture and going back to the thought again that young people are evil, premeditated cheaters of the system and they all want to, you know, just take down the man and, you know, screw the businesses. And actually, a lot of the culture of free stuff isn't really any more about um, trying to cheat the system. It's about convenience. People want something quickly and they want it first. So this is an example of a, of a band called Odd Future, who are a hip-hop act based out in California. And they completely flummoxed the music industry about two years ago because they cr created this amazing music and they were just giving it away. Mixtapes, tracks... Not their B-sides, not the crap stuff that they made in the studio that wasn't so good for the album, but all of their best content. And they made loads of it, and they gave it all away for free. And they created this huge fan base of millions and millions and millions of fans who followed them online, who talked about them, and who propelled them into this kind of this huge stars that Universal Records then tried to sign and couldn't. And they wouldn't let them sign them. They're like, we don't care, we don't want your money, we've got our fans, and we're just giving stuff away. And it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Instagram is another great example of a business that has created something fun, simple and free and given it away and let people use it. But obviously, we can't give everything away for free because we're all here to make money. So it's about that being part of a bigger plan. And obviously, as we well know, Instagram ultimately sold for gazillions. Um, and is now really, you know, they're all sitting there sitting pretty and, and feeling very pleased with themselves. So make it part of a bigger plan. Be altruistic wherever you can with something and your young customers will reward you for it. Don't give them the crap stuff. Give them something really good that they can use and they will talk about you and they will love you for it. Um, so to summarise, uh, technology encourages an open platform for thought, experimentation and democracy. But um, because of all of that, we have to remember that the importance of great craft really remains. And so although there are lots of people out there that can do stuff nowadays, it doesn't necessarily mean that every single person that we engage with has to be a, a child, a blogger, or somebody that's got no experience in creating. It's really about how humans with experience can work together with technology and how we can engage young people who are experimenting to do interesting things with us. When humans and technology work together, we can make the most beautiful things. And I'm going to end on a little video.
just showed that purely because it's really beautiful and it just really beautifully illustrates this idea of humans and tech working together. Thank you very much.